This episode is brought to you by Paraswap, the leading aggregator to find best prices across various DEXs. You'll hear more about them later in the show. And this is the, the crazy part about it. It wouldn't have occurred to medieval you that you were permissioned. The idea of being permissioned means you know what being permissionless is like, that you know what agency or the ability to do other things is like. That was your world. That was the air you breathed. That you're like a goldfish in a bowl. It <laughs> never would have occurred to you that that was wrong or even that that was the case. And so sometimes I make this comparison and say, hey, you know, medieval you, what a chump, right? Like uh, it didn't even occur to you. But like what will future historians say about us? All right, everyone, we have uh, another special episode. I really feel like I say that for every episode, but this one is actually really, really special. Uh, the, the history nerd in me is the most excited I've probably ever been for a podcast episode in the history of doing these things. Uh, a lot of people don't know. I was a history major, and my, my friends know that when I'm not talking about crypto, I am talking about history, which makes me a really, really boring person to hang out with for people who don't like either of those things. But today we have Josh Rosenthal, uh, who is a PhD. He has a PhD in, uh, I think it's medieval and early modern history, if I got that right. He is a historian turned VC. Uh, and I'm just so excited to talk to Josh about uh, both crypto, but also the Renaissance. So Josh, welcome to Empire. Hey, thanks for having me here. Big fan. Appreciate all you do on Number of Fronts. And uh, I did not know you were history. Me. It's funny. There's a definite flavor group of people that are into humanities, not just arts, but more kind of storytelling and generally, you know, qualitative humanities type things that are into crypto more than you might know. Most of us don't talk about it, though. It's still kind of we're in the closet on it. So I'm yeah. glad you're one of the members. I Well, I actually think there are a lot of folks in uh, in crypto who studied whether whatever, whatever you want to call it, humanities or liberal arts. Uh, Mike and I, we, I mean, we just have to, we, we're like starting at this base level of just knowing psychology. Mike was, I think, uh, psychology and classics. Um, I'm mm. pretty sure it was. And I was history. And so we, we never learned finance, right? And so we're learning everything from the ground up. Uh, and I think it, 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 it just gives you this more open view of the world. No, that's crazy. I, my minor field, my PhD was actually classics. So that's a, it's, it teaches you a different way to think about problems. I, the Web2 guys call it kind of first principles, but it's a, it's a different definitely a different way of thinking about what's happening and what might happen. So good. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Super exactly. cool. Yeah, now exactly. that we've, you know, ostracized 98% of the audience. <laughs> I, I know a lot of finance majors listening to this to be like, damn, damn. All right. <laughs> Turning off the podcast now. All right, I think a good place to start would just be, can you set the scene? Can you take us back to medieval life? Actually take us back to medieval life pre-Renaissance, during the Renaissance, take us back to what this like permissioned life during that period of time when uh, looked like. And I think we can use that as a, a kicking off point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like I'm not into crypto, just to be totally clear. That's like not my thing. I'm, I'm more into kind of like cultural and societal transformations and mostly from a historical perspective. So call it Renaissance, especially like these shifts between you know the late Middle Ages and the early Reformation and Renaissance was an epic change. And so I'm into those kind of things. And it just so happens that crypto is you know, an iteration, a recycling, a retelling the next chapter in the story. And so for folks who aren't into spot trading or finance or into kind of weird pixelated cats, like if you're into like history and particularly like what happened in the past and what might happen in the future and like how we can mitigate unintended consequences. And like at the end of the day, like I see this as a giant story, one in which we're actually players. So if you're even remotely into, you don't even have to use a C word or call it crypto. If you're remotely into the way the different changes and how people work together, how money might work, how your work might work, how you might do governance, any of these things like crypto is just the natural ex, you know, extension of that. And, you know, the transformation from the late Middle Ages to the Renaissance, you know, we call it a Renaissance. That basically means it was a rebirth or a recreation. It was the death of the old world and a recreation of a new world. And the old world, sometimes I trick people and I say, hey, just imagine medieval you, like what would your life have been like? And essentially like the word that comes to mind is permission. It was fundamentally hierarchical, but for you experiencing it, it meant that everything you did or wanted to do was permission. You need to ask someone else in authority for permission to do something. So like statistically speaking, you're a farmer. You've never been more than five miles away from your farm. You can't read. You can't write. Your life is very difficult. You work from dusk until dawn every single day, and it's, it's backbreaking work. <clears throat> You've done that. Your parents did that. Their parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, their parents, about four more sets of those. That's what your kids will do. Your name might even be farmer. Like that's who you are. And if you ever had an idea to change that, if you said, hmm, 
this this authority, I don't quite think it's legitimate. I think these institutions are failing. That idea probably never would have occurred to you. Ideas aren't transferred around. There isn't mass communication. You, you can't read, you can't write. And like those ideas are sealed in documents of power. So it's very difficult for you to have a, a different idea. You know, occasionally things bubbled up from time to time, ideas that, you know, rights and values should be different. And those were brutally smashed down, partially because it couldn't gain enough critical mass from the community because you couldn't share ideas and you couldn't, you didn't have capital to like pursue those ideas. Wealth was permissioned. It was concentrated. Most wealth was in land and animals. That seems crazy until you realize like most people's wealth is in their house today. Um, it's land and animals, but you didn't have access to that, just statistically speaking. And yeah, there was some coin and currency, but that really wasn't for you. And you couldn't spend it as you wanted to anyway. There are things called sumptuary laws. And so you didn't have access to wealth. You didn't have access to spend your money as you wanted to. You couldn't communicate at scale. New ideas wouldn't impact you. Um, and like these two things like fused to form your identity. The idea of the new wouldn't have occurred to you. It was so effective in terms of hegemony. Like for them, religion wasn't just private belief. It was the structure of their like cosmic reality. And at the top of it, there were authority figures, pope, cardinals, archbishops, bishops, archdeacons, subdeacons, priests, prelates, all the way down in you. And the same thing with, you know, the political apparatus, which was interwoven, you know, Holy Roman Emperor, imperial electors, you know, all the way down. And then there's you. And you're at the bottom of both of these things. And so as a historian, and I'm kind of an odd one in that I look at complex systems and even kind of modern events, we pull on these threads. One was value. All your value was permissioned. One was communication. Your communication was permissioned. And one was identity. Like these two things like stick you. They put you where you are and you're not going to change that. Your stars are set. You know, you're, you are a farmer. You will die a farmer. Your kids will be farmers. Don't even think about anything else. Um, you cannot leave your land without permission. You can accumulate wealth without permission. And most of the time, those people in permission, in authority would deny you access to that. And so that was your life. The kicker about it is, and this is the, the crazy part about it, it wouldn't have occurred to medieval you that you were permissioned. The idea of being permissioned means you know what being permissionless is like, that you know what agency or the ability to do other things is like. That was your world. That was the air you breathed. That you're like a goldfish in a bowl. It <laughs> never would have occurred to you that that was wrong or even that that was the case. And so sometimes I make this comparison and say, hey, you know, medieval you, what a chump, right? Like uh, it didn't even occur to you. But like what will future historians say about us? And so I kind of walk through those same threads and say value. You think you control your own money, right? Maybe, unless it's worth less and less every year. And you don't even know how much less it's worth. Do you believe the CPI or that? You can spend it any way you want to. You're not subject to those like medieval sumptuary laws, right? Eh. I mean, I used, tried to use a credit card to you know, attend a crypto event, and that credit card denied payment. And they said, we know the content is not fraudulent. We just don't like those ideas being discussed. We're not going to run it on your rails. Or communication. Like, obviously, they can, uh, they can de-platform you, right? Like, that's just for the crazies. Mm, historically, it tends not to work out real well for the rest of us when you start de-platforming the crazies. Or they could cut the cord. Um, you know, there won't be another Arab Spring like we saw in Egypt. Like, they know how to cut the cord now. And so things like decentralized broadcast and DVPN is incredibly important. But we're still, they may let you keep talking, which means like a medieval, they may transmute your time and attention into their product in Web2 and Fang. Like a medieval lord, they'll harvest the fruits of your interaction and you don't even know it. And they might use a magical incantation to shape your reality, what you see and what you respond to, called an algorithm. And so in many ways, we're very similar to our medieval twins. Our life is permissioned in a number of ways and we're not aware of it. Um, so that's kind of the setup. So when I look at what's happening today, I say, hey, value being concentrated, communication largely you know, permissioned, and like identity, the point is it never occurs to us, is very similar to what we saw in the Middle Ages, if that that makes sense. Kind it does of a crazy make, thing to say. It does make sense. It does make sense. So, I mean, there's so much to unpack there. And I think one point to maybe double click on is just identity. Um, and within identity, just the, the idea that you could have new ideas um, that really started to shape what a new identity looked like. I was a farmer. My father was a farmer. His father was a farmer. And now for the first time ever, you have new ideas. And I think it's too, uh, important to just explore like in crypto, uh, paying homage to the matrix, we call it like, did they take, did they take the red pill, right? Uh, you know, are they red pilled? Are they down the rabbit hole? And what allowed people in the Renaissance to go from farmer to farmer to farmer to farmer to I'm taking the red pill and I'm expanding <laughs> my mind. Like what, 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 what happened here? 
Yeah, yeah. In in some ways, I mean, it's it's one of the craziest transformations ever. Um, like I said, there are a number of renaissances before. When we say renaissance, we think of like cutesy angels or Michelangelo or this or that. Um, there are, that's because that's one we remember. There were a number of renaissances before that, you know, kind of known to historians today, but we've forgotten about all of those because they didn't last. They didn't have staying power. They really didn't transform at an epic scale. And the one we think of did partially because it succeeded where all other renaissances failed because communities like use two different type, they use decentralized technology. So it kind of gets to what drives history. Do you think it's means of production? Do you think it's great men with ideas? I actually think it's like communities using technology and they used a particular type of technology, not just Silicon Valley kind of hedge funds say better, faster, cheaper, like specifically decentralized technology. And this decentralized technology had a generative function baked into it. And so it, it kind of didn't need adoption. It created its own adoption. And so specifically, if we pull on those same threads, <clears throat> so they started using uh, for value. There was a new protocol. It was called double entry bookkeeping. You may know of it as like ledger based accounting, right? And so one of these families out in the middle of nowhere, you hadn't heard of them at the time. They're in the sticks in the south of France. They did the Renaissance thing and went ad fontes back to the sources, dusted off this book. And uh, they came up with a new way to do accounting. Instead of doing transaction reconciliation, transaction reconciliation, they did debit and credit. And so that allowed them to... To, do, to create all sorts of new financial fundamentals, to increase speed and like to unlock capital, which there was enough coin to handle credit anyway. And so it just exploded and transformed like the nature of finance. And so that meant new players won. This family called the Medici went from nobody to, you know, taking the seat of <laughs> the papal seat and the throne of France. But they also, along with everybody else, started disseminating that capital in these new financials, which weren't available previously without this ledger-based protocol. And so now you have loans, tens of thousands of loans, hundreds of thousands of loans. You couldn't have left your farm, but now you can. You can get a little loan. And you can't read or write, but you kind of keep a little ledger. And you can make these ch chicken scratches in it and kind of know what's going on. So you actually financially can leave. But then, like, would the idea have ever occurred to you? At the same time as that permissionless uh, financial protocol was, you know, taking over the world by storm. So too, there was a permission, uh, permissionless communication protocol, and that was the printing press, which, you know, in the internet, everybody says, oh, the printing press is like the internet, blah, blah, blah. I'd say the internet might have been that, but it kind of followed this false fork to where now it's re-aggregated, what I was talking about, the medieval lords being able to control it. So at the time, the printing press was crazy. Like those documents of power, not just ideas, but um, access to capital, access to rights. Um, you didn't have access to those. Those are sealed on manuscripts. They're incredibly difficult to get a hold of. They're geographically proxied. You'd have to travel somewhere. Someone would have to let you in. And, you know, writing a little thing would take like a year, basically, to copy, right? Super expensive. And the printing press was like crazy. Like by all objective of standards, it was a horrible idea, right? Like Gutenberg would have got kicked out of every venture capitalist office because he's taking out this protocol where only 5% of the people are eligible for like only 5% of the people read, right? You can't take that protocol to market. And yet that printed protocol had this generative nature where it not only created its own market, creating literacy, it created new types of interpretation and communication that we couldn't have otherwise imagined. And so you're printing and it's very decentralized. Like you could set up a print shop in the back of a store and like no one would know it. Some cities tried to KYC printers, but it didn't take a lot to skirt that. And, you know, sometimes they complied. But the point was it was everywhere instantly and it proved, you know, unstoppable in a number of ways. And rather than when we say printing press, we think of like Gutenberg's Bible and these long textual based things that take forever to print. That wasn't what you saw. Saw. Medieval you moving into Renaissance, you didn't see that. You saw you saw a flugschrift in a, a giant broadsheet, right? Watcha! And it had a it had an image on it, a woodcut image or a copper etched image. <clears throat> and so you hadn't seen art before. Medieval you had seen like you know, art was 2D flat and symbolic, but you hadn't seen it. It hadn't made its way to you. And now all of a sudden you're seeing art at scale. So the printing press allowed art at scale. And it wasn't just art that was pretty. It was art that communicated meaning. It had semiotic impact that these symbols meant something. And they meant that the reality you were experiencing was only one of many possible realities. You could, you could change your stars, if you will. And those things had snappy taglines on it. So you might not be able to read, but you get your buddies together and you're doing it down at a public, you're doing it at a bar and you can kind of figure out what's going on. And it basically was a sharp knife that just pricked authority. Um, some of these are crazy images like demons pooping out, you know, authority figures. To us, it'd be like money printer go burr. You see that thing and you go, oh, wow. They're the memes, now the I memes of the Renaissance. 
they literally were memes. I mean, there all there's always symbology before, but it was symbology plus mass media where you could do it at scale. And so now these things are flying all over the place. And farmer you says, hey, the authority that keeps you permissioned is illegitimate. You can do something else. Here's a bit of capital to get you started. These things is the birth of proto mercantilism, the birth of capitalism. So that was crazy. And then also there was a mind shift too that that was communicated in those ideas. Where previously like the sacred was purely religious and that was all that was worth being commemorated and the common and profane and mundane wasn't. So you see the art shift and the technology is baked into the art, which is like worth noting. It looked weird and odd to the power holders at the time, but um, to the people who were seeing it for the first time, they understood the, the, the meaning and the symbolic unpack. And part of that symbolic unpack was, uh, was that uh, being apart from the world wasn't the only thing that was worthwhile. So in medieval you, you were a farmer, you were worth nothing because you're toiling away in the world. The people that had value, they were outside the world. They're off in a monastery or a cloister or a nunnery. And now these images come along and they say, hey, what you're doing in this world with your family and your friends and your community members and even your work, you can work in finance. And that's a glorious, amazing thing to do. That was radically transforming to say, not only are you not subject to authority, which says you can't be participating in this world, you have capital, you have ideas. And one of those ideas is that that cosmic hierarchy is flattened and what you do in this world matters. And that was enough to get a lot of people to uh, to leave the monasteries and you to leave your farm. And you uh, you started all these crazy, these crazy new economic models, thanks to these new financial fundamentals that's a that's a long answer but that's a it's a big question yeah yeah i mean i think the two most important things there are just that you there was the creation of two different things you had double entry bookkeeping and then the spawn of the medici family right and then you also had gutenberg i I love the gutenberg story right because i think um if i remember that story correctly it it was really technology that was invented in china Uh, but gutenberg builds it in Germany. I might be wrong about this. He builds it in Germany because he thinks there's a market for this. But when you actually look back at how Gutenberg talks about the printing press, he just the market size, the the TAM was so, so, so off, right? He thought he could produce books by it was like the hundreds or the thousands. He never thought it was like, he never thought, I mean, how many books are out there? Billions of books probably now, right? He was just orders of magnitude off. And it just reminds me so much of, I want to draw analogies to crypto, but also just analogies to the internet, right? Like the total addressable market um, uh, of, of what people thought the internet could be. And now what, what folks think crypto will be is just orders of magnitudes off from what most folks think it will be. No, that's one of the things, like when you tell the story, you kind of shorthand, but you could, none of these things were new. There were iterations, you know, print Chinese, double entry bookkeeping coming from Roman, from Pliny, North African communities. They, the Ad Fontes piece was kind of the Renaissance thing going back to sources was rediscovering a lot of this. And your point to the TAM is really important. So, you know, if you view Web 2, so I kind of view history as a pendulum swinging back and forth, broad strokes between aggregation consolidation, which is TAM, total addressable market, big as you can get, own all of it, and decentralization. And maybe it just swings back and forth. Maybe it ratchets up and thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But either way, you know, the world we're in now is very hierarchical in terms of permission and value aggregation. And part of that is our business models reward that, right? You want as big a total address mark as you can get, and you want as much of it as you can get. And that's kind of like Fang's playbook, right? And so like saying, crypto is saying, hey, I can take pieces of that TAM and pull them out and redistribute them to the little people along the long tail and part of that ownership economy. So it's a different fundamental like model towards that. And that's actually what Gutenberg like ran into. He thought TAM was one thing and the ability to scale that, to take those pieces of value out and distribute them, scatter them, like seed them all along the long tail, it can grow, it can compound infinitely in ways you can't imagine. An example of that, he thought he could only sell, you know, a few thousand, you know, books and he was probably right. It only was at the time, like books were were not what sold. It was this new form of media, which he couldn't have otherwise imagined, this giant broadsheet. That was what went, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Like Luther in any given year is accounting for like 50% of the things printed with these broadsheets, right? And so like the decentralized technology created or recreated the TAM in a fundamental way. And so we look back and we say, hey, Renaissance was highbrow and it was hoity. And there definitely was a bit of that because it was remaking institutions. But mostly it was a common, it was a commoners, it was a lowbrow phenomenon, right? It was in the bars with these images. And that's what Gutenberg couldn't quite figure that out. And part of that is kind of what we see in crypto too. Like if you really believe that this decentralized technology is generative, if I mean it can create like, it can solve perverse incentives, 
it can create like virtuous cycles out, not just through smart contracts, but through social coordination, like in fundamental ways we haven't seen before, it allows you to do amazing things. And at the Renaissance, it was, you know, a couple memes were doing what, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, imperial mercenaries couldn't. They're taking down these, these hierarchies and, uh, you know, same thing today. One of the other good questions, historians, if you want to get super advanced, go into the AP class, like you always look at like continuity versus discontinuity, right? Like how is it similar? How is it different? And so in some ways, like, yeah, the internet, for sure, you have this in mass, you have this in scale. The difference was you don't own, you, right now you don't own what you create for the most part, right? That's a medieval lords, fang aggregators harvesting that. And with the printing press, that wasn't the case. The people actually owned those copies and were able to sell that. So like the value, the ownership was baked into the communication. And it wasn't just, you know, Anytime you have that happening in a cultural recreation, it follows this pathway, right? It starts with finance because it's the most valuable. Then it goes into identity, which we see with like NFTs and things like that. And then you go into work with DAOs and then you go into school and education for propagation. And then you go into people who aren't interested in the movement, but just in the benefits. In that case, it may be like crypto is a business model, not just metaverse, but turning cost centers into revenue generators. And so what happened with the printing press was people were participating. Art became more fluid. It wasn't just you know, an artist ticking off, you know, a box, people were participating in different ways. And by having the ownership layered on to the object of sociality, they could participate in ownership in different ways. And that's what opened up all sorts of things, whether you're a printer, or you're an artist, and you're now getting paid for that, or whether you're a disseminator or distributor, like that actually, the thing you see is like a layer, an image of like the underlying social coordination, not to get like too crazy and philosophical on it. But all these things, if you look at like the Web 2.0 philosophical darlings, like McLuhan and those guys, like they say, hey, mass media, and you have the advent of it, and the media, and the message is tied to the media. It's like McLuhan's first book was the Gutenberg Galaxy, right? He starts with Gutenberg for a reason. And like, we've been kind of talking about this as we've been re-aggregating into like, you know, kind of modern, kind of federal, like Fang Tam aggregation, our philosophers have been starting to say, hey, imagine a world or science fiction writers, imagine a world where like you basically can have media where it's owned or where you have consensual like interaction on technological rails. Like, you know, McLuhan loves Chardin and that's like new sphere, which we'd call the internet. And so like now you have for the first time in history, the technological capabilities to take this renaissance further than we've ever seen before. The last renaissance worked where the other ones failed because we had technological capabilities, double entry bookkeeping and printing in a way that we hadn't before. And now we're engaging in this quantum leap. We started with a tech and said, oh, we can do the internet. Maybe we can do a bit of this like, you know, digital banking stuff. And now we have these underlying primitives and like, it's not just arithmetic. It's not one plus one and now we get two. It like, it goes hyperbolic. That is all this could be wrong, but like, this is kind of what tends to happen in history if you look long dura if you look over these long epochs. And that's like the last thing I'll say is that it's like this weird irony or paradox, it's an inverse correlation that the people that are witnessing the greatest transformations in history are the least likely to recognize at the time. If you read the medieval historians or the Renaissance, they just don't recognize what's going on. And like one of the images in history I always kind of use a metaphor is like waves or the ocean. And so these deep waves, you don't notice those. These currents, maybe you kind of see, but you see the little ripples on top. And so it's just too difficult for us to like notice those waves. What you do see is you do see the destruction and you see the chaos. Like to the people in the Renaissance, they didn't think it was a glorious time with gilded angels. They thought it was the end of their world. Their currency was largely worthless. They thought their institutions were crumbling. It was super volatile. They thought they were done. And that's one of the things that history can do to kind of like help guide us is to, is to allow us to say, hey, is this the end of the world or is this part of the deconstruction and the recreation? And like everything I see, and this isn't just me pontificating. This is like years in the archives looking through like the source code, if you will. It looks really, really, really similar to what we're seeing today. Yeah, it feels uh, it feels very uh, it feels like Neil Howe could have had a field day. It feels like the fourth turning could have been uh, written in the Renaissance as well. Uh, you know, there's yeah. a lot of fear and like, uh, you know, you've had this big uh, like just a lot of spook, like just everyone's basically spooked and uh basically this mass fear in the market and every the, your way of life is changing. And to you, the person who your life is changing, it's scary. But to us, hundreds of years later, looking back, you say, what a glorious time. And I do feel like folks could look back on today and, and think something similar. Yeah, this isn't like when when stuff really dies historically, it doesn't die 
with a bang and market chaos. It dies with like a whimper and you don't notice it. It's like fall of the Roman Empire. The historian's like, wait, was it was it this date or this date? We don't unless really you're Luna. Know. Then, then you, uh, unless you're Do Kwan and you really end with a bang. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> even that, it's like, it's just from a historic perspective. We've been doing this, what, like a few years, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, we're so early in this. Like, I know it's not pleasant. Like, we're deeply affected by this, right? Like we have our guts punched too, but it's like, you have a choice. You can either like be suckled by these like medieval institutions and that's like super soothing. They're playing lullabies for you and that feels good. You go to college, you get the office, you work in finance, da, da, da. Or you can kind of go out on your own. If you go out on your own, you do get punched in the gut. That happens every single time. But like, if you're not experiencing that volatility, someone else is doing it on your behalf and they're arbitraging you. And like, the risk is actually staying in a failing like status static system. That's when like things go bad. This stuff, as crazy as it sounds, is actually a leading indicator of it working out. Doesn't mean you're not going to take losses short term, but this is this fits the rhyme. It fits the pattern. It fits like the general rubric of what happens as things are like massively transformed and like from kind of a Pascalian wager. Like, what do you get if you lose? Okay, you. You participate in crypto, you lost some money, um, not good, you wasted some time, you met some people that are kind of nutty, you learned some other technology, fine. You saw a glimpse of what the world could have been. Um, and if you win, like it's just asymmetric though, there's nothing else out there. Um, so I, th I think it's worth making yeah. that bet. But yeah, it doesn't feel good. But honestly, this is just part of it. It doesn't make it better, but this is this is what it looks like during a renaissance. Like historians always wear these rose colored glasses and you're like, you talk about all the people that kind of kept their hand and kept their cool and blah, blah, blah. You forget about like, you can either beat the market or beat reality by like betting against it, which is very difficult to do or getting in big on something early. And like, this has all the tells of being something early, including the volatility is actually a tell, which is kind of a crazy take, but at least historically speaking, tends to be true. No, I tend to agree with you. So if I'm speaking it back to you, and I, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, basically the Middle Ages could be described in one word, which was just aggregated, right? Like both value and information were centralized. Culture was top down. The church held the power. The church centralized and guarded information. You were a farmer. Your dad was a farmer. Your kids are going to be farmers. You didn't travel far from your farm. You didn't read. You didn't write. You farmed, right? And identity, therefore, was very permissioned. It was this strict hierarchy. You were born into this like rigid system where farmers stayed farmers. Uh, otherwise put, maybe you have like a lack of identity, you might want to call it, um, or maybe just a very permissioned identity. And um, I think you also mentioned something around just literature, right? Like information and writing was often very esoteric is maybe in Latin. It was stored in private places. Literacy was extremely low. And boom, you get two technologies. You get the double entry bookkeeping, uh, popularized by the Medici's. It increased the money velocity. It You had these new financial products and loans and well, maybe what feels like DeFi today uh, or Bitcoin or ETH. Or like that's, that's kind of what I'm hearing when you say these things. And it led to this economic rise to power through this new ledger-based tech. Um, it feels so similar to today. And then you have the printing press. And for the first time, ideas could be spread permissionlessly in a permissionless manner. Uh, huge threat to the church. Sounds like they tried to KYC it, couldn't shut it down. Only 5% of the population was literate. Uh, so maybe a bad idea, but no, we get memes um, and memes make it into the bars uh, because of the printing press. And now these ideas that used to be challenged behind closed doors, they could now be printed and, and they had there was the velocity of the memes increased. Um, and what this did is it basically just unlocked, it turned uh, Italy, I think Florence maybe was the, the hub, into this cultural center of Europe. And that brought new art and new jobs and new ideas to the table. Uh, and that sparked what we know as, of, as the Renaissance. And oh my God, even as I'm just saying that, it sounds so similar to today. It really does. So, I mean, I'm curious, I, like, how, how did we do there? <laughs> no, that's pretty good, man. You were a history student. That's that's better than I, I could have rambled on. No, that's like, that's so good. That's the thing. Like for them, Renaissance was a recreation, like literally the word means rebirth. It's like death of something, recreation of their society. They thought their world was going to end and they were right. It like was uh, destroyed and recreated at every level, military, economic, political, work, social, art, identity, philosophy, ontology, epistemology, like anywhere you want to go, we could go into that. That's like a thousand percent correct. And the, the technology was 
decentralized, which had this generative nature, which meant that uh, it kind of created, it, it literally created it, renaissance things, if you want to use that as a verb. Stuff that shouldn't have worked, <laughs> but, you know, when Gutenberg says, I don't think it'll work, or somebody thinks it won't work, it did work because, like, the decentralized nature of it allowed different people to share in the ownership and created these virtuous mm. cycles, like, kind of long along the tail that wasn't, that wasn't possible before versus just aggregating TAM. And, like, it... Uh, it, it, it tended to work in ways that we couldn't expect. Like if you look at kind of history of innovations, it's always two folds, right? One is like same thing as before, better, faster, cheaper, fine. And then there's like the next fold, which is like something we couldn't otherwise imagine, which wouldn't have been not only possible without this tech, but we couldn't have otherwise imagined. And so you're essentially unlocking communities to work together, like which sounds so simple, but it's like if I want to get you to do something, or if you want to work together, I can pay you and I can share ideas and coordinate, right? And like without those two things, that that just wasn't there. So it was it was really crazy. And like, yeah, that your identity was given to you. It was top down. And so it was something you're given. Um, and you could say, you know, the church just wasn't the church. It was the whole structure, right? So that's like what you're born into. And like those like religious links were socioeconomic links essentially too, right? Oath of fidelity and obligation and the reason why you'd honor a contract. And so when those, Luther came along, like Satoshi just forked all that and like all that giant pyramid just goes tumbling down instantly. And so now the question is like, what do you want to do? Um, and so, which is crazy to say, hey, he essentially like forked their reality at every conceivable level. And so that kind of smashes your world apart. But now you have these other tools in hand and you can work with other people in the same situation. So totally scary. You're out of the nursery, super volatile. Craziness ensues. Lots of people point out like there's craziness afterwards. Wars of religion, all sorts of stuff. Like, yeah, totally true. Um, but um, the interesting thing about it, like, is if you play the story forward, so that's kind of where we are. Same thing. Like the the reason why the tech is generative too is because it was a sandbox. They're experimenting with fundamentals, right? Financial fundamentals, governance fundamentals, like these little things that became our constitution or became Edict of Nantes or something. Like all these things were up for grabs and they played around in the sandbox and like a thousand flowers were blooming, as crazy as that sounds. And so we play it forward, what happens? You know, Renaissance, good times. Um, and then like stuff starts aggregating again, right? Like the pendulum swings back again. And like it aggregated through really specific means. It aggregated through like three kind of things. It aggregated through like identity. Um, the power holders came and said, okay. So the decentralized technology put the power holders in check because they could either ignore it and lose ground or they could participate in it and thereby by legitimize it, right? You're you going to let these Protestants run around with printing press? No, you need to like, you need to KYC it. That doesn't work. Okay. So we keep ignoring it and they keep graining adherence or we participate and thereby we legitimize not just the technology, but the idea that a different reality could be valid as well. And so that's kind of what happened that didn't work out so well. And then they started re-aggregating and they did that partially through identity. They said, hey, you didn't know this. You always thought you're part of a family or part of a geography. You're part of this like nation. You didn't know that. Congratulations. Um, nation means um, we have certain abilities to like look at you, to observe, and you have all these obligations to us. Surprise. They also like monitored very carefully language too. And then finally they, uh, they, uh, they really nailed down property rights. Like the great Achilles heel in the Renaissance was property rights. You could take your currency with you. You could take a little ledger, which represented value. You could take a, a broadsheet in your sack, but you couldn't take your, your house or your thing. And so that's one of the differences, like doing that historical compare and contrast. One of the differences that we see with this Renaissance is same thing, very similar. You're a thousand percent right. The difference this time is that we have like property rights on chain. We call them NFTs. You think of them as pixelated cats. It's fine. But like it's property rights on chain for synthetic things and IRL things, which is crazy. And that's like, again, it's not just arithmetic. That's a hyperbolic unlock, the likes of which we've never seen. So we're facing like much stronger hegemony, like we're permissioned. And when I say much stronger, they're more sophisticated at it. Just like medieval Lord, like, windowed your identity so you couldn't think of anything else, like Overton window or what have you, like, our, our permissioned like uh, structures are much more subtle. They're much softer. We tend mm. not to notice them, right? Just like medieval you. If you're if you're a nation state and you have to use force on your people, you get an F. If you have to threaten it, you get a C. If it never occurs to them to do that, you, you get an A. You've done a good job. And so those are the tools that we're seeing. So we're up against that with these like new like weapons or tools that we can use. At the same time, back to your Neil Howe and like things breaking down, like we are starting to like see that like really fundamentally. So it's really interesting. Like our world is like static. We have these institutions. We're born in this blip, right? 
you and I are born in this blip where there's like these pathways and playbooks that tend to work. Get a go to school, get a job. Things tend to work out for you, maybe depending upon who you are. Like all that is coming unwound institutionally. So it's like it's a really weird time. Like, um, and what crypto did back then is what it's doing now. It introduces a new variable in the mix. It splits their reality. So previously, we'd have these clan warfares, or we'd have these like you know national conflicts, and you know we'd be friends with somebody and enemies with somebody. You'd have like an X Y axis, right, on the political spectrum: conservative and liberal, fiscal and social, right. Maybe it doesn't match up, but you at least knew what it was. And now crypto gave them this Z axis, right? Like, are you closer with somebody who has your values um, and are in crypto? Or are you closer to somebody who has non-crypto values that are outside of crypto? It's split everything. And so, like, post Bretton Woods in our reality, we have, like, not first world, second world, third world, like, rich and poor. It really is who's for us, who's against us, and who's undecided. And so crypto is splitting that. And just like you said with Florence popping up and little city states that were kind of in the middle of nowhere, there were other things on the global scene too for by people who adopted that. It gave them access and rights. And so we're seeing the same kind of thing. This enemy of my enemy is my friend and the political lines being redrawn, not just social uh, and fiscal, conservative and liberal, but also crypto. Are you into like independent call it sovereignty basically and that kind of got hijacked a little bit by crypto anarchists which is fine but like we're starting to see the development of this like sovereignty as community which mm. is like all that's long story short to say as you play this forward we re-aggregate we're at the eve of the middle age or we're in the middle ages we're on the eve of the renaissance it's very similar now we have nfts for property rights and like the crazy thing about it is like what are we going to do with it this time um and like history mm. will judge us by by what we do so these blips and volatility that's what we should see the question is like what are we going to do and you rarely you just don't get these chances in history that often it just never happens so that's kind of the point we're at all right everyone quick break from the show to share a big update from our friends at paraswap the best platform to stake swap trade farm and more paraswap just launched gas refunds based on how much you stake you can now get up to 100 percent of your gas refunded on all of your swaps on Paraswap. This is huge for anyone who has spent a lot of time in DeFi or maybe it's just starting out, you know how egregiously expensive the gas transactions can get. The gas fees are ridiculous at some points in time and now you can get those entirely refunded on Paraswap. To participate, all you need to do is stake a minimum of 500 PSP. Big shout out to the Paraswap DAO for making these refunds possible. Really, it's just, it's tough to beat Paraswap right now. They give you the best prices. Uh, they save you money. You've got this gas refund if you stake PSP. They've got a smooth and really user-friendly interface, fast swapping. It's really everything that you'd want from a DeFi platform. If you don't use them already, check out Paraswap today at paraswap.io. Now let's get back to the show. I can't help but think my, my biggest takeaway from everything you just said is that what happened in the Renaissance was there was an excitement around identity for the first time in maybe hundreds of years or thousands of years, right? You have, you have excitement around your identity um, because of the freedom that you have. And uh, I actually see a lot of similarities to today, right? Like no matter where you're born into in, in let's call it America, you have you kind of have this almost predetermined path, right? If you're like very low income, born into poverty, like you kind of have, that's your identity and like that's your path and, and hopefully you can break out. But on the, uh, and the same, the same thing exists uh, if you're born into like a very wealthy family, right? You're born in Greenwich, Connecticut or like Upper East Side, New York. Like you're gonna be a lawyer. You're going into finance. Like you're gonna be fine, but like, man, that's not that exciting of, of a life, right? And so when I think about what's happening in crypto, like when I hang out, the reason I, like love hanging out with all my <laughs> weird internet crypto friends is there's this just like palpable excitement that it, that exists, you know, and there's just so much optimism and enthusiasm and just excitement around what you're doing, which really what you're doing becomes your identity. And it feels like there are a lot of similarities to, to the Renaissance. And I'm just, so I'm curious to get your take around identity. And especially when I think about what's happening with, I mean, uh, paradigm, like paradigm hired a high schooler, that yeah. has never yeah. happened before. That's not something that's not that that high schooler's identity like they're a high schooler and then they have to go to college and then they get internships oh. like they're breaking the mold of identity. And it feels like the last time we saw this was maybe the Renaissance. 
No, that's exactly right. Like you actually get to choose, right? You couldn't choose yeah. where you're born. You couldn't choose your your lines of patronage and allegiance. You couldn't choose any of that. Um, and with with the Renaissance, you actually could choose. You could actually choose like your beliefs, like actually determined your identity and the symbols you wore. And like, are you this group or that group that like unlocks certain things? It made you the enemy of these people. It made you like friends with these people. And that had like different opportunities for employment, for finance, for spread of ideas, like these things forked. And then eventually it became like political and, and military as well. Um, so you could actually choose for the first time, which was really, which was really crazy. Like previously, you know, your identity was set and then you could kind of go up or down a ladder depending upon the degree to which you participated in the institutions, right? Like the the birth of that privileged knowledge and geographically gating it, that's the birth of like the medieval universities, right? Like you're you're behind this thing. Um, and so like being able to say, hey, you don't have to go to a specific location to be exposed to an idea in the Middle Ages. You can actually see the same idea in print anywhere you are in the middle of nowhere that opened up like different worlds for them, right? Like they could participate not just in the exchange of ideas, but in the like opening up different types of profession. I um, mean, so it really, it, it fundamentally toppled like who they were. Like a lot of the movements adherents were like from lower classes, right? Why? Because like they actually had the opportunity to not just accumulate wealth, but change like what they did, but also how they thought about themselves. That's why that ideological impact to say the most valuable thing isn't outside the world. It's you participating in this community, doing something together. I mean, the same thing with crypto to say the most like important thing isn't like, you know, private bank, this or that, or elite art or behind these gates, but to say like anyone has access to this. And it's not just like something, you, a sticker you put on your VW bus. There's like, there's real economics tied to that because you have ownership baked into the, the media and you can experiment with these fundamentals. And so like you being able to control your identity, that's the fifth bucket. You know, you go from finance into identity and then you go into working and then into education, that last bucket to say, hey, and this is, again, uniquely with this renaissance through these property rights to say, you could actually work wherever you are, not just remote work, but you can work in a synthetic world, right? right. And you can earn in a synthetic world and enjoy the fruits in the re IRL and arbitrage the difference, which is craziness. Or you can work in like, you know, IRL, enjoy the fruits in a synthetic world where if you're careful, they can't like have access to that property. Like NFTs acting as these like bi-directional doorways that allow you to enter these synthetic worlds. This gets a bit esoteric, but this is not something you teach to undergrads, but you often say, hey, the idea of like imagination and invention and synthetic worlds, like a lot of that is like spun out of print for the first time. You're exposed to not just like morality tales, but like these ideas of different worlds that aren't yet. And so like print is really the advent of the synthetic showing you like what's not real and what could be. And like that allows you to like participate in it and change your fate and fortune and alliances here in this real world. And that's literally what we're seeing. The same thing, even down to the art looking, you know, weird and odd because the that art is like baked into the text which has monetary value on it and like semiotic mean you're you're unpacking this meaning to it um so like yeah really really unlocking these new worlds and that wasn't just european it was global and you could kind of extend it around that but like we're seeing very very similar things take place and yeah you can still find the outliers and say hey you're under this regime here and you don't have access here and that's true but we're starting to see a dislocation you know the irl slip and slide from the synthetic and like you as your identity be able to say, hey, in this plane, my identity is determined in this plane. It's not. And now this one can generate into that one. And so it gets it gets real dicey. Like the historical way you always tell this is, oh, there are these wars, of religion, people crack down. The the history was really more complex. It was slipping. It was sliding. There were little pockets of geographies that popped up maybe near you. My enemy and my enemy could be a friend. A geography that took advantage of it early days would became a would become a powerhouse for the next, you know, a few hundred years. And so, yeah, we're seeing that dislocation of like identity and identity like that's kind of the superset. And like NFT allows you to do that, like where I where I spend my time mentally is a function of who I talk to, messaging and communication, and like how I spend my money with like assets or property or currency for things or helping others. Like it all kind of goes together. And just like at the last Renaissance, we saw this explosion of governance. If now I'm not being told what to do in hierarchy, if I can have representative functions in different ways, and these are new fundamentals, we see new fundamentals in finance, but so too in governance, you know, pluralism, federal republicanism, like all these like governmental experiences that are like unfolding. So we say we speed run art fine, like down to the details, 
like I'm generated, I'm on chain, I'm a participant. We speed run finance, we're doing that. It's bumpy for sure, but like that's what happens. And now the next phase is speed running this governance to say like, how does it work? And like what I would predict in this unique historical moment is as our, you know, as our globalization kind of deteriorates for a variety of reasons, see Peter Zion, and as like our institutions like fail, like, uh, like atrophy for a variety of reasons, like crypto by being decentralized allows us to instantiate our identity and retract it in different ways in different places. So just like the Renaissance wasn't a spectrum, it wasn't highbrow art here and lowbrow art here. So to identity, like your KYC, you know, state issue identity versus your anon tied to an address where you have proof of experience or expertise or accomplishment, and you're a high school kid in paradigm, we hire anon kids all the time. Like um, it, it, it changes the nature of like saying it's not, I'm not a byproduct of like credentialism from external party. Uh, it's from like the community and my accomplishments, which is really much more meritocratous um, and kind of balkanized, allowing multiple things to coexist at the same time. In a aggregated world where TAM is everything, there's one thing, only one can win, maybe two, you know, VCs will talk, trad VCs will talk about duopolies, maybe two. In a crypto world where I'm taking pieces of TAM and scattering it, now multiple things can win with different design choices, right? It might be trad, it might be CFI and DeFi, this chain, that chain, and like rather than a monoism where there has to be one thing that wins, like what we've seen historically with crypto is that a pluralism where different design choices which fail in different ways at different times actually create a broader generative lift than what we've seen, both economically and socially. It's a it's a crazy time. So that's why I say it's a renaissance. It's like literally we're seeing communities using the same types of technology in the same ways, reinventing the fundamentals. We're not aware of it. Sure, it's super volatile. It's not dying a slow death. It's It's like chaotic and like, chaotic fine like it, it fits the pattern really really closely hmm. josh let me ask you something here which is in the renaissance people people it's not that people in the renaissance weren't religious they were they didn't they didn't oppose god they didn't oppose religion they opposed the harsh rules of the church and it kind of reminds me of and and, and i might be getting that wrong but just to go with the question like it kind of reminds me of today we don't necessarily oppose government we don't oppose finance. We oppose the harsh rules that the government can put in place. We, we, we oppose some of the, the harsh rules that some of the financial institutions put in place. Do you see parallels in that sense? And, and maybe the secondary question would just be like, is there anything we can do if you're the government or you're finance, like these financial institutions, can you, can you stop it? Or is there anything that you could do? That's such a good take, man. That's a history major in action right there. That's exactly, that is like, no, not condescending at all. That is like, that is spot on. Like there's, <clears throat> I'm always hesitant to go into this because like people get ruffled, but like you, you have to distinguish the institution from the ideology, right? The content of belief from like the, the physical apparatus, like in time and space that controls you, right? And those are like, those are like different layers. And like one layer is like, what do you believe? Should there be like a church? Should there be a government? And then you can also like distinguish like the idea of like government or a church or like authority. For sure, you need authority. You can't have people drive on both sides of the road, blah, 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 for sure. But then you're saying like, then the next layer is, are you actually opposing this instance of it, right? And what in particular are you objecting to this instance of it in terms of institution? And like for a lot of people, that institution is just because it's calcified, because there's there's no other alternative. It, it's virtually impossible to like to change the nature of like two party system in the year. Like it, it's super difficult because of like a variety of forces. And like it's not like there's a bad guy. I mean. It's not like you're telling a story and there's a villain, right? This is just a function of the historical time we're in. Cruft accumulates and calcifies over time, and then it gets so heavy and it crumbles under the nature of its own weight, right? Some of that's demographic. You can talk about workers to retirees, some of it, and that has like implications for education, for finance, for all these things, right? Like if I'm a victim, if I'm in that specific situation, I'm a pension fund manager. I'm not getting my 7% unless I bet on something like this, right? So I get out of these things, I jam into VC, VC gets hyperinflated, I go into tech. Like, it's it's not that anyone's being bad. I'm in a complex fallen system where like wheels like grind, basically. Like the only person that took down the Holy Roman Empire was like just institutional craft, right? You're in Napoleon after that. It's like the bureaucrat, the guys at the desk. He could beat anyone except for like that. Like it's a function of that. And then eventually it crumbles. And so like you as a government have a choice, like, how do you want it to crumble or how do you want to remake it? You're going to have to remake yourself at some point by by <laughs> pleasantly or unpleasantly. Like, do you want to like control and participate in that system, which is where it gets like really interesting. And yeah, from the church perspective, like 
it wasn't, we say church and everybody's like, we put on our modern filter. We say, oh, like my church, what I believe. That's not what was going on. That was like, that was the largest landowner that claimed temporal authority. They said they were the ones that controlled the sword and the armies, not the military. And they largely won that fight. The Holy Roman Empire is like kneeling, begging like uh, contrition. Like basically they won that fight. And so what happened, this is crazy. And there's a crypto analogy in here. What happened with the Renaissance was as they went back to the sources, they found that a lot of those sources, particularly the documents, that had led to this accretion, uh, this like piling up, were false. They weren't legitimate. These are even like Roman Catholic guys, like Erasmus is reading this donation of Constantine, right? It's this, it's this document where like the whole, where the Roman emperor Constantine says, hey, I give you the armies, Pope, here you go. And they find out that the thing's a forgery, right? And so now they're like, oh wait, like my document is false. They're using like scientific technique. They're going back to the code and they're auditing the code of authority. Like that's wrong. What else is wrong? And like, we see a lot of stuff going on with that. Like I think part of the, I don't want to call it the part, the problem of crypto, but it's a reason for the volatility, which is why it's a leading indicator of its power is that we're actually seeing what's behind the scenes for the first time, right? We're seeing, oh, someone can front run a market. Oh, wait. So yeah, somebody in crypto does that a little bit and it's awful. It's like, you're just seeing that for the first time. That's been going on the whole time. Or somebody, or you mm. say like, oh, this gives unfair advantage to whales. Yes, of course it does. It's always been that way. Like now you're seeing that. And so like now for the first time, when you see take those blinders off, it's not pretty, but you start getting the ability to play with it, right? You can say, hey, maybe we do different types of voting. Maybe do quadratic voting or you do, you, you can play with these like fundamentals. So like the church wasn't just the church. It was their military and economy and university. It was everything. It was their culture. This, if you want to use the word the state, the state was subservient to the church. And like Luther unraveling that unraveled every single layer. So everything was up for grabs. It can get dicey, wars of religion craziness, or it can be kind of managed. And what tends to happen is you tend to have some hierarchy and you have, tend to have some decentralization in a complex system. It's not as if it's CFI or DeFi or KYC or Anon. You tend to have like in a healthy, complex system, it tends to be pluralistic. We kind of forgotten about that, where you have different people making different design choices that aren't just accepted and okayed, but you hate those people over there, where they actually reinforce and help generate in the system. So when DeFi goes this, CFI does that. When CFI does this, you get some balance out of it. Right now, things are still super correlated, but that's how a healthy system tends to unfold. Like mm. what'll be super interesting back to your fourth turn is like, what happens on the political scene now that you have X and Y and now that you have like X and Y and you have a Z axis on it, right? How do people realign? For a while, I'd say just putting on the poli sci like history hat, we've kind of had a mismatch where fiscal, social and fiscal conservative or uh, tend not uh, like conservative, social, conservative, fiscal, the boxes for parties tend not to work so cleanly anymore. And now with somebody entering crypto, entering like a Z axis saying, hey, what about self-sovereignty? What if you can like create your own world in your own way and start from the ground up. It's not just a threat to like nation state in terms of fiat or currency. If you ask a political scientist, if you ask a PhD in poli sci, they'll say, hey, uh, a nation state is like a imagined community, their words, not mine, instantiated by, um, by, mon by uh, currency and contract. And you look at crypto and you say that's currency and contract and imagined community is consensual identity. It, it might be a reemergence or an iteration of what a nation state actually is. It might look very different in the in the future to come. Hmm. A long answer, but you're asking oh, big, you're asking these short questions, I, but they're like really big I, I, questions. I, I, so here, here, I'll I'll hit I'll hit you with another one. So we're drawing all these big parallels between the Renaissance and 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 Web three. And I'm almost honestly one of the things I'm thinking about, Josh, is like we're so zoomed into Web three. Uh, but yeah. when I'm hearing you talk, I'm like the internet, Web three, in the arc of history, it's all one thing. It's not like this decade was in the internet. This decade was crypto. Like if I'm if I'm 200 years in the future, I'm just saying like th th those like 30 years was like this new thing, you know? Mm. That's so good. So, no, that's like back to that like ocean analogy. You see when the when the currents change, right? You know, those ripples, you forget yeah, about them. Yeah. Oh, there is an internet. You don't even remember AOL or Netscape or GeoCities right now, right? Like those were dominant, Tam, and you've kind of forgotten about them. Like in this big picture, when you look back, the further back you get, 
the more you only remember the more significant changes, right? And everything else gets compressed. If I were to go esoteric on you in the Renaissance, I'd say, well, there's like early and late and it was distinguished by, and you'd be like, what are you talking about? I only want to know that like this thing changed, right? And that's what we're going to see, like the internet, we're going to see, hey, we had the ability to like do zeros and ones to do like digital communication at mass. Cool. And we did that for like 40 years and then it got re-aggregated. We're like, oh, that's not good. Why'd that happen? Oh, because ownership was ripped out of communication. Fine. And then we're going to look back and we're going to say, hey, crypto is like you controlling and owning those zeros and ones and being able to instantiate what they mean about you, what they mean about value, what they mean about an idea as you so choose. And whether those zeros and ones reflect a monetary signifier or whether they reflect like pixels for an idea or whether they reflect like a call to like who you are as like a wallet you instantiate or retract, like you're going to forget all that. So they're going to say like the Internet, they're not going to remember the Internet. They're only going to see crypto. Like, and we won't talk about it that way. And the same yeah. thing with that. Uh, they won't talk about Web3. They'll be like, what are you guys talking about? It'll be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so they'll they'll only see crypto and communication, of course, will be part of crypto. We just won't remember anything else. Yeah. Um, and we probably won't call it crypto. Like, well, it's just like back in the day, there's like an Internet fund and an Internet company. And like that it just becomes the fabric of reality. So we'll say, yeah, right. in this new world where like people actually control their own abilities to do these different things, this is, this is how it works. Like. Doesn't even yeah. make sense. You won't even know if it succeeds. You won't remember the nomenclature, which is one of the tricks of like history. Why like the biggest changes tend to be forgotten. But yeah, you're yeah. a thousand percent right. You zoom out and like this is the big thing. And just one other thing. Historically, there are all these little false forks before big transformations. You forget. I mean, like you as the historian, I'd say, I say Luther. You're like, yeah. But if I were to say Whitcliffe and Huss, they did some of the same things. You wouldn't really remember who those guys are, even though they did similar things. Right. Like they got burned. You don't they were like losers. You don't remember about that. Right. But they're doing similar things. Like, why did Luther succeed where those guys didn't? Well, because he had like a permissionless print protocol and ledger based accounting to help him like propagate it. Right. So you have these little false forks that gain, they were big. They rocked the world. We've just forgotten about them because they aren't big enough. And like that's what's happening with the crypto renaissance. We get these tremors beforehand and now we have the tech rails to like work at scale bottom up. So like mm. it's it's very tight. We could go down to like even almost the source code of it. It's like super crazy, like how how well the analogies hang up. Mm. When was the fall of Rome? <laughs> Depends how you're looking at things like this sounds super postmodern, but it's like it's true. It depends like you could say, hey, like when the Republic fell and it went imperial, lots of people would say that's like the fall of like Rome, the Roman Republic. It goes Caesar, right? Like maybe it's that. OK, maybe it's when there's no more Caesars. But wait, that barbarian guy, he became Caesar, right? So now you have a barbarian Caesar. Is that is, is that real? And then like globally, even in the Mediterranean, you'd say the thing never fell. Like, I mean, basically there was always like an Eastern half of it. And then we kind of talked about it this way. And so like, it gets really, really tricky and it like forces you. That's why these threads are super important. Like I yeah. say value, communication, identity, but what threads you pick, what question you ask, what you mean by the question, the details like determine your answer, which is crazy. So you can say, yeah, like, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I was going to try to make a bad analogy between the fall of Rome and the fall of Web 2, but I'm going to pivot my question, actually. I'm going to pivot my question and say... <laughs> that's, that's not a bad analogy. It's no, no I'm going to completely pivot No, but it question. is. Like, did it, did it die with Fang? Is it dying with Web 3? Like, when does yeah. it die? It's a really good question. So we're drawing these big analogies between the Renaissance and, and Web 3. I think one thing that feels different to me, though, is... So in... In the Renaissance, right, you have this civilization where you have enough money that's left over to create these like great works of art. And when you create great works of art, you create culture. And Italy, unlike a lot of other European countries at the time, their culture didn't really disintegrate, whereas a lot of other places in Europe had. Uh, a, it feels like in America, culture is kind of disintegrating. Um, so it feels like America might be opposite today. And then B, you you talked about these like the expansion of markets and like uh, exploration and things like that. And like, I just think of, um, uh, you know, Columbus going to ask Queen Isabella to, to sail West, to go try to find India, right. Because they figured out the world might not actually be flat and like Vasco de Garna and, uh, in India in 1498. And like, I just think of like this great period of ex exploration. Uh, when I think of America, I think of like, we, we kind of stopped doing that 50 years ago. I think of like Panama Canal in the early 1900s. I think of the Hoover Dam in the 1930s. I think of the GI Bill in the 1940s, the Marshall Plan after World War II. I think of like creating the highway system in the 50s and 60s and, and even DARPA in the 50s, which led to the internet, right? We don't do any, and, uh, and obviously the biggest one, like the Apollo space program in the, in the 60s. Like we don't do any of that anymore. 
Uh, and that feels like a big, a big difference between now and the Renaissance. Yeah, no, that's, there's so much, man. You ask these short questions, but there's, there's like 10 different ways to like tackle this. It's like a really powerful question. Like, um, we could do kind of the philosophical or down to the detail. Okay. So, um, so one way to think about it is like form versus function, right? And so like, if you, on um, what happened was at the Renaissance, it did when you teach this to undergrads, and like this is like, a, a, I don't even mean undergrads, when most people think about this, we always think about things in terms of being binary, right? And it's like there's high culture, there's low culture, there's wealthy, there's not wealthy. That like helps us place things in our head. They're categories. It's like we're Victorians, like in a room with a parlor and an eating room and a sitting room, and like that helps us think about it. But really, the Renaissance like really undid things at both levels, the highest culture and the lowest culture. And like, we tend to remember the high culture now today, partially because like the high culture, the universities like largely won. <laughs> and so that's why, and they're high culture by nature. So they're telling you about like Michelangelo and blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's why it's helpful as like in the past 50 years, historians have started to say, hey, what did the people on the ground actually think about this sort of stuff? So on the high culture, it was radical. It was a transformation, even in Italy. Previously, you have a religious scene. You don't have a pagan scene. You don't have a scene out of your own mind and your own creation. That was craziness for them. That was flat out craziness to say, you don't need permission to paint this content even at the height of this. So too can you paint these other pieces. And like, that was a process. So church gets feisty with Michelangelo and then he weaves things in subtly and da, 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 da. But even at like, even in like, you know, Italy, it would have been, it would have been complete craziness. And that's one of the reasons why to validate these changes, they use the form of what had been done before as, as much as they could even the emperors like the holy roman emperor so when you say hey when the roman empire fall fall like if you ask charles he's like it didn't fall i'm sitting right here or whatever like they, they retell the story as like a piece of it and so like even the images that we see that were like high culture those were radical to them like the oil paintings you're seeing or the sistine chapel where they're using that was like you hadn't seen that before that was like ar and vr and even that painting was a technology which was rediscovered from like Rome, like back to the, the the sources the dutch right so that was going on and that was that was fundamentally the people in power the the smart ones who were riding the wave grabbing on to like the new institutions as they were reforming them changing like what it was and what it meant for them and then at the same time there is a bottom up not just a high, but also a low. And that was what you would have seen. You would have seen these images and these like woodcuts and these copper etchings that aren't so realistic in perspective, but are much more like much more symbolically oriented. And those symbols weren't just like for the dum dums that couldn't read. They were like they were powerful. They caused like something in you, like emotively, to say, "Hey, this is my tribe. This is who I'm with. This is what I value, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. And so that really like. You know, the Italian city states are like, you know, they're in the middle of nowhere. They're in swamps. They did well financially. And that's that's like one end of the spectrum. They were able to reinvent themselves to renaissance themselves from that old world to not only like persist in power. They they were early adopters and they gained asymmetric advantage on that. They're fighting off France and what have, they took over France like subtly. <laughs> right. Like it's a they did a really good job at that. And so like, yeah, for the U.S., part of that also was um so their disruption changed, like the way we would think about that. And that's kind of what we're fit, hitting into now with like, we're on the demographic decline, basically, just in terms of numbers, along with most of Europe and the world or what have you. So our exploration probably, it might not even be physical. For them, a lot of their exploration was like synthetic. And I don't mean metaverse, but it was like these ideas in these books actually became more real. And it was those ideas in books that actually drove the change in the real world, whether it was age of discovery or exploration or what have you. And so I think we're going to enter a period like that where like as our demographics invert, we're going to get more interested in the synthetic. And like by most people say metaverse, metaverse replacing reality. I don't mean that. I mean like the synthetic world, call it a metaverse, actually augmenting reality and driving a new age of uh, of discovery, not in the sense where I have to throw just human power at it but where i'm able to pick and choose different places is it like as it has a generative function if you're to zoom out into world history you'd say hey the ottomans did this and that's what kept charles from stamping down luther like one of the things i, I think we see in the renaissance is that enemy of my enemy is my friend thing was really different right because now i might have people i'm traditionally aligned with but as they choose to differ on this new forking of reality, we'll call it crypto, but call it pluralism or whatever, I might have new friends and allies that I had never imagined before. So uh, I think one of the reasons why 
like we're in the middle ages there wasn't a lot of that going on right and then the renaissance allows this blossoming and, and like going forth that's kind of the point we're at we're only now just stepping into the renaissance when you're right when you look back and say hey we've kind of been you know haven't been doing this or that part of it's like when the whole thing gets retooled you have to go through that process before you explode yeah. out i mean so maybe I the that's funding the we're at Maybe the funding comes from different places, right? Like maybe maybe it's DAOs creating these great works of uh, public funding, right? Maybe the next uh, space program doesn't come from from the American government funding it. It comes from a DAO led by Elon Musk, you know. So no, no, there's those those things yeah. are literally. I don't know if you were talking about the same ones I'm thinking of, but those things are going on as right, we speak, right? right? Yeah, and so like yeah. those are. And not just funding. That's kind of what I mean when crypto actually starts taking on more of the nature of the state. I mean, you know, exploration, space exploration, like uh, education, economic development, yeah. even public goods. Right. If you look at that, like full disclosure, not financial advice I'm super biased. If you look at like what Helium did in San Jose, where they're like, hey, state, city, you're not providing broadband access to your people. We're going to do it for you. Like it literally <laughs> in that fifth bucket where crypto starts acting as a business model rather than a technology that allows you to turn cost centers into revenue generators, which means yeah. things that aren't financially feasible in the real world actually can like work. And that also means that you can incentivize like public goods and exploration, all the stuff that gets cut out of aggregation or only for their own ends. Now you can do it all along the long tail. So now I think that you're yeah. exactly right. We're I've just opening my, it up right now as we speak. I've got my helium set up, my Nebra right here. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to move it because I've, I've like positioned the uh, the little signal at the right, exact right thing. Uh, but <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> I'm, That's exactly, I'm with but you. you're starting you're starting to see that on like the public goods. That's like a really good tangible. It's yeah, like yeah. we're still super early. You're only seeing like crypto as a business model like unlocks right now. But I think you're going to see a lot of it over the next couple of years. So. Well, it starts to get really fun when, you know, at a certain point in time during the Renaissance, the institutions had to say these technologies are just better, right? The, 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 the institutions had to say uh, maybe the oh. Medici's are onto something here and the... Um, you know, they had like they said, OK, our, our way of creating books and, and written word is like very archaic. Like, let's just do what this Gutenberg guy says to be done. And I think it starts to get really interesting when institutions, you know, they never like new technologies, but eventually they're forced to participate. And that's that's what I'm excited for with with crypto. No, that's a that's like that's a thousand man. Me too. Like that's that's actually the heart of the historical. So right now, super volatile. Everybody's losing it. That's fine. That's what happens. I see that as a leading indicator. A slow death would be like you don't know when the Roman Empire like fell apart. This is like this is like much more pains of rebirth and renaissance. Like and so what happens at some point? The institutions adopt it. They just do. Technology's yeah. better. You can't keep doing manuscripts, right? Um, or you want or financials or what have you. And so like. Then it gets really interesting because like your early adopters are usually like zealots. Like if you want to write crypto Twitter, super tribal because you need those folks, right? You need like the 15 year old boy who's like yelling at people on Twitter. Like if you're going to be a zealot and you're going to do it when there's nothing there yet and you see the future, like more power to you. The tribalism serves like a really important historical function. But then as you start getting institutional adoption, it starts to cross. Right. So then it gets like really interesting when the institutions start doing it. Then like you, if you do it well, you end up with pluralism, which means a lot of things for a lot of use cases, right? CFI, DeFi, and they gener they're generative, right? Um, so like a lot of the early adopters will say, no, we don't want this other thing. It doesn't have these values. And like, I personally don't take that side of like maximalism on anything, even maximalism on like crypto values, decentralization or what it's like, it's great. If your thing is the best thing ever in the world, more power to you, but in a complex system, and this is like my, my PhD was at like, you know, uh, the Institute for Ant Studies in Paris, like at the Sorbonne, like I promise you complex systems work better when there's different points of failure. So somebody may make a worse decision by your values and maybe, maybe even an objectively worse decision in a complex system, it's stronger. And so mm -hmm. to your point, when you start layering institutions in there, now it gets interesting. If you if you say, hey, I have the best chain or the best DAO that's the most crypto value, blah, blah, blah. Do you want 100% of that or do you want it in a mosaic or a patchwork of other stuff? I choose a pluralistic representation every single time. I've, it's a different, this yeah. isn't like something I say a lot out in the crypto world because everybody goes batch it. No, I mean, something that I just pieced together is like crypto is, everyone thinks of crypto as a technology. You could see crypto as not as a technology, but as a new way of um, organizing communities. And if you extrapolate that out to, you know, I asked this question about like, or I said this thing about institutions, when do they get on board and stuff like that? It's like, okay, step one, like crypto is not a technology. It's a new way of organizing communities. 
communities are historically always the ones that create history. Institutions don't create history. Institutions participate in history. So crypto, new way of organizing communities. Communities create history. Institutions participate in history. I don't know. Never thought about it like that. No, it's, it's a different way. And then you say, well, wait, what's the nature of that technology? Like, is it just better, faster, cheaper? That's why internet, false fork, da, 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 better, faster, cheaper, fine. That just aggregates TAM and like plays institutions. Yeah. And you say it's decentralized where you have like different communities organizing. And a decentralization allows plurality. It doesn't just allow one or two to win. It allows esoteric interests all along the long tail to be financially and socially viable, right? In a, in a TAM world, I have to wipe out that long tail and crush it up to my TAM to get a stock like value that's worthwhile, right? That's my business model is aggregating that long tail. In a mm -hmm. crypto is an economic model or social coordination model, like that allows me to have all these little flowers growing along the long tail. And like this little one that wouldn't have been economically viable, now all of a sudden it is economically viable. That's why I keep talking about this as a business model, turning cost centers. Look, this building or coffee shop down the street, if I want to listen to music on Spotify, for you it's nine bucks. For them, uh, I have to pay BMI 30K, right? Or 15K for somebody else. And then if I'm processing, I'm paying 5%, and then I'm paying for a lease. If I take every one of those things and I flip over the crypto model where I'm uh, creating ownership, all of a sudden I'm packing up. Like I'm listening to Audius, I'm using Solana Pay, I'm using Helium. Pick whatever you want, I don't care. All of a sudden, like that coffee shop becomes viable, right? And I don't need like a coffee chain aggregating it. And so yeah. now all of a sudden I have all these different things all along the long tail that I can participate in. And like these things might not have the same values. One might not be as decentralized as the other. And like from a complex system that makes a better failure point, failure point, and just from like worldview of what you want the world to look like, I want, I want like people to be able to express like like obviously false ideas in terms of like design decisions. Like it makes it actually generates and makes it more valuable with me. And so like you saying the institution's coming in, for sure. That creates that mosaic. And then what tends to happen if you really believe in the technology and you don't have to pound people into it, is that those values tend to stick on. And slowly the institutions adopt and then all of a sudden their people become part of the communities and hmm. now what's happening, it sort of changes. Like that's the way that communities make history. It's a it's very much a bottom up co opting like uh, institutions. Man, this is super. This is the most I've ever gone into historiography. This is crazy. I, I have a, I have another one for you, which is just thinking about money. <laughs> money there. Um, what the Renaissance did is it made it so that the florin, what like the florin was the currency of one city, uh, was the currency of Florence, right? But yet it it succeeded where. What was the currency back then? Like the euro? Like I don't, I don't. Even Everybody know. I guess their, everyone had like, a different one. Yeah, but, it's craziness. But maybe the analogy, you could, like here, what's my question? I think the Renaissance made it so the florin became this widely accepted currency, right? And now in the maybe late 1400s, you had this like global currency that was um, kind of this like global reserve currency. Um, maybe for the first time ever, I don't know. Um, I wonder if we see crypto, if like if we do the same thing with crypto for whether it's a USDC or it's a some decentralized stable coin that is so far from getting built because of all like we're, we're just far away from get, building that. But like I want I wonder if something like that happens and if we really yeah, do recreate like, money. It's like to go really deep into like, you know, on the eve of the renaissance, there wasn't enough coin for like, what is it like one fifth, one tenth what's needed? Like there wasn't there is a bottleneck in terms of the actual money production. They couldn't print like we could print. We knew how to print stuff. They couldn't do that so well. And then there are all sorts of issues. Are you taking it off the edges? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. But like the point is, even in like an even if you had an aggregated economic world, they couldn't have generation because there's a bottleneck on the production until you have that on a ledger to say, hey, I give you credit mm -hmm. for this and you have debit for that. If I have a credit and you have a debit or if I have it both, that's two less like instances of coins I need. So like that literally allowed like the that's the birth of proto capitalism or mercantilism, partially because that the f old financial rails in the medieval world weren't technologically proficient enough to allow commerce at scale. And so like with DeFi and crypto, like we're doing the same thing. We're having like commerce at scale in different ways. Like part of that is access. Part of that is like synthetic versions. You want to do something on a synthetic stocks, like whether you're geofenced. And then like to your point, there's different winners and losers out of there, but those winners look different. It might not be the same paper piece of money. It might actually be like something that's a digital implementation that's the backing on that, right? And huh. so whether that's a, a digital USD, it it tends to look different than you would otherwise expect. But yeah, you're it's a 
It's an unfolding in a way that we haven't seen before. The first is the same thing, better, faster, cheaper, synthetic. The second is a new fundamental that we couldn't otherwise imagine. Maybe it's Alchemex or something, no affiliation, but just like I give a loan to myself so I don't get liquidated, liquidated, right? Like different weird stuff I couldn't have ever imagined. Or a synthetic version of Apple I can buy in China yeah. on a DeFi exchange or something. So like, and then that to your point, like, how do you want to play like the early adopters? Like it's always innovators dilemma, right? You want to disintermediate yourself? No, nobody wants to do that. Like, OK, like <laughs> at some point that tends not to work out so well. Um, like you have to participate in it. Otherwise, you lose too much ground. But if you participate in it, you legitimize the, other, the other's action. So it'll be really interesting. The way I think it'll work out is like not crypto versus non-crypto, but whose crypto do you want? And I probably see that like layered in terms of like a pluralistic overlay where you have you have centralized, you know, currencies, and then you have other back stable coins, then you have other things on top of that. And then at the other end, you have complete anon. Um, yeah. And I don't think people will participate in one level of the stack. I think they'll participate in different ways, just like we kind of do today. You said something interesting about when we were talking about the Florin about, um, and, and yeah, I completely agree. You'll participate across the identity stack. You might have like three different identities, but you said something interesting about the Florin, which is that capitalism is basically created during the Renaissance and capitalism was really created in Florence and you get the Florin and things like that. Um, yeah, it, like Italian city states in during the Renaissance were really thriving, right? And uh, it creates this like merchant class, AKA the middle class. It kind of like either creates, maybe recreates, let's, let's say it creates the middle class. And what that did is it, so then the, the merchant class, which was like our middle class, and created this like demand for clerks who could read and write. And that created this need for education, for like mass reading and mass writing. Today, we're really struggling in America with the middle class. Um, like the middle class is really dying out. And I do wonder if crypto, like if the Renaissance A created the middle class and then B like leveled up the middle class, like taught them how to read or right. for, forced the need to read and write. I do wonder if crypto could, is maybe like the savior of the middle class here and could really be something that levels up the middle class middle class. But maybe now I'm drawing too many analogies between the Renaissance no, and No, that's today. my take. I mean, that's my take. I'd step softer on the Italian side because the North Renaissance. So no, that's absolutely my take is that like as institutions fail, when I say institutions fail, I don't mean they go out of business. I mean, they stop serving the role that they were designed to, right? So if I say, hey, here's a college, uh, it's going to cost you five, six figures. You have a 50% chance of graduating and like, and I'm not really going to hire you on it anyway. Do you want to do it? Like it stops serving that role, right? Like, um, yeah. And part of that is just demographic reduction and what have you. And so like, so what happened was the the Italian city states are like the great exception because they were very decentralized. They were like a federal, they were like little independent nations. We don't even talk about it in Italy. They're like these little things. And so, yeah, you had some universities, but it was usually it was very decentralized in terms of how they were doing it. And they were at this hub. And so like a lot of the stuff came out of there just because of the nature of how they're interacting. And like when it gained scale, largely through print. So now I'm reading like how to do double entry bookkeeping. I'm like, oh, hey, that's great. And now I read that up in Northern Europe. And when it hits Northern Europe, like, yeah, a lot of historians will say, will say, um, and it's hotly debated, but I, I tend to put myself among them to say like, yeah, the Renaissance created like capitalism. Sometimes they qualify it and they say proto-capitalism because it's not fully fleshed out. Or sometimes they call it mercantilism, which is like another way of saying capitalism and for all intent and purposes. <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and part of that was because they had the tools. When it hit Northern Europe, it went at scale, bam. And then part of it was also and I can't emphasize this enough, but this idea that you could take independence, you could you could do so, the back to this ideological thing, right? Like this is like Max Weber and like uh, spirit of Protestant work ethic or whatever. Like it's not I'm not doing something holy by being outside the world and by you know milking a cow in like some monastery where there's like 20 guys there or whatever. Right. Like I'm actually doing something by like working in a shop in a center of commerce doing that with my family and my friends and that's not bad to do i can do that to like the glory of like i have this calling to do it what do i like and what am i good at i've been divinely put in that spot so i'm going to work hard to do it i can literally like interact with this world and not only is it not evil it's actually great to be doing so you have people with tools which are coming up out of the italian city states for sure 
and they're hitting like these centers in mass. And these people are saying, whoa, I don't have to kind of apologetically do this behind the scenes. I can go all in and make this my identity. Like I'm a merchant and I'm not like taking shit from like, you know, the, the prince down the street. I'm saying I'm a merchant. I'm funding you. Right. Like that's crazy. Just to give you a sense of like the economic change, like when one of the Holy Roman emperors, like right before Charles, like he couldn't he didn't have enough money to buy like his his wedding dress. Right. He goes into a city, he goes into Nuremberg and they're like, we're not going to give you credit. Like, I'm the Holy Roman Emperor. You're not giving me credit. I'm not going to give you credit. Like, I don't believe. So like that idea of like that unlock of credit, I can't emphasize enough how crazy that is when that hits. And so, no, absolutely. And like one of the reasons if I'm aggregating stuff. So one other question you could say is, hey, why didn't these big financial houses do all this stuff? Right. Because it's not worth their time. Like it's not worth their TAM. They're aggregating TAM. They're only doing big deals. Right. I'm not going to do all this little stuff all over Europe, here, there in the middle of nowhere. Um. And so like with the technology, it like literally allows me not to do two things. One, to make it economically viable to do this small stuff. You can think about it as the unbanked today. And also it means I can do that even being out in the middle of nowhere. I don't need this guy's permission at the head of the curve. I can do this on my own. And so you have an explosion of all this stuff. And like capitalism comes from like that bottom up, basically. It's very difficult to dictate from top down. And so now your your take mm. on that, I see that as absolutely correct. It wasn't just like the Italian city states is the model. What happened, it was always very small percentage middle class with them anyway. They, they were a player, don't get me wrong. But when it hit at scale through this new technology, that was the birth of the middle class, as we call it. Like, um, And then like the deconstructionist historians get feisty and you go back and forth and debates with them. But the point of the story is like, that's the birth of the middle class um, and like not an accident. And so when you say, hey, I'm middle class, I, my beer costs me more, my gas costs me more, like not just inflation, but like education costs me more. I have this predefined track and like now what am I going to do? Like the problem that I mean, the Bitcoin guys will say like back in the 70s, like Eric Weinstein, they say I have this problem, right? Like I can't continue this hyper growth. If I have five partners at a firm and a law firm and then more people come on, I can't keep replicating partners, right? So there has to be a contraction. Like there's like strong reasons why that tends not to scale in terms of an aggregating TAM, it can only get so big until I over leverage because there's nothing else on because I'm running a pension fund. Hence, like NASDAQ right now versus crypto, like it is crazy, but it's a different kind of crazy. It says there's an economic model where I can take from here and do here, which is mm. like if I'm middle class or anything but like ultra wealthy, like that's what I'm betting on. This might be my last question here. I'm, 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 I don't want to extend the analogies too far, but the last thing to think about is like tying it back to the very beginning of this conversation, farmers and farmers and farmers and farmers. And then, um, so you basically, have, oh, okay. So, so Martin Luther is like early 1500s publishes the 95 theses, right? Like the, the power of indulgences and that started the reformation, right? And the reformation starts to dissolve the monasteries, uh, or, or maybe it like hurts them or something. It hurts their business or something like that. And so maybe, um, when businesses get hurt and the monasteries get hurt, I'm assuming like 10 or 20 or 30% of the people work in the monasteries, they go into the workforce, they leave the monasteries. It's huge. And Damn, that's good. I, I just wonder if like, if that's like people working for DAOs today, it's like today, like, what do you do if you go to a good college? Like you go work at like in consulting or like you're a lawyer or you're a banker or like you just do, you follow the path. And that was the path. You like when you were either a farmer or you went and worked at a monastery. And then the Reformation yep. comes around and, and Martin Luther and he's got his memes. And uh, and now and then you could go do what you wanted. And today we have crypto and you can go work in a DAO and you can work in multiple DAOs. And I just I don't know. Maybe I'm drawing too many analogies. No, here, that's like I think that is like historically spot on. If it overstates the case, it only you need to overstate the case because it's difficult for you know modern you and me to understand the nature of that transformation that is. That is it a thousand percent. I mean, it's funny. I don't know if you remember that from your history, but like, yeah, it's a dissolution of the monastery, right? So if I'm a medieval lord and I give away 10% of my estate every generation, I do that for 10 generations, guess what? Like all that's super concentrated, right? And like what I do with this church, I give it to a monastery. And so I have guys running around, they're doing stuff. And so dissolution of the monasteries, all that land goes back up for grabs, number one. And then that workforce, they're all these people. So Luther, like Luther's a monk. And he gets married. He divide. He defies his vow because he says that vow is like illegitimate. And who's he marry? He marries a nun, basically, right? <laughs> and he says like there's nothing like there's nothing less holy like milking or sweeping up is like what you're doing off there. In fact, he says I'm actually being more holy here because I'm helping people instead of being off in the middle of nowhere. And so like this workforce explodes, and like this idea of like merit, like it explodes the population. And like this other idea that I'm I want to do it for myself, capitalism, blah blah blah. But there's always big 
baked in this doing this for your neighbor, this idea of like capitalism too. I'm doing this so like I can help my community. I can help my neighborhood. I can help my neighbor who needs that. And so like that's like a really interesting like point that like with this asymmetric opportunity also comes like asymmetric obligation. There's a lot of people down the distribution curve that like would like to help their neighbor but don't have the means to do so. And like now you can, right? Like now you can work in these different DAOs and do these different things. If I'm outside my traditional path, which might not be working for me in the future, I can do these other things. And in fact, like here's the real mind mender. Maybe I can make helping people as financially viable or more so than just like working for myself. And so the <laughs> idea of public goods and 501c3 as just something I do over there because I've already done my real stuff over here changes just like with Luther doing my real stuff here and then helping out over here. Like maybe these two things get interwoven. And I think we're we're starting to see like pieces of that. So no, I don't think you're far off. I don't I, I think you're not even going far enough as I mm. describe it. Yeah. This, we've lost like 99% of the people here, but this is so I'm good. I'm surprised if anyone's listening to this at this point. I'm like, <laughs> I'm having a ball, though. this is great. Nobody's listening at this point, but, um, Josh, this has been like truly such, I just, I, I, I went full history nerd on you and just like, <laughs> I, it's really rare. I find the, uh, someone who has as much is, a, is as interested in crypto as me and as, as is, is way more interested in history. Probably. I mean, you freaking PhD. That's like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's just it, it. This has been such an interesting conversation and a fascinating conversation. I'm sure people dropped off like 30 minutes ago, but that's OK. <laughs> no, it's fine. Like the thing is, if anyone's listening, like I'd say, like, I mean, honestly, I'm not into crypto for crypto's sake. I'm into it because I, I think it literally is like all the tools It may amount to nothing, but it's like the very best chance we get for like a fundamental change and a fundamental redistribution of like the way we work, the way we create value, the way we communicate, the way we represent who we are and our own beliefs too, like philosophical, religious, ontological, epistemological, like it gives us this opportunity to do anything. And like the thing I'd like people to take away is that like when you're in the middle of a transition, you never recognize as a transition and it always looks chaotic. And that's exactly where we are like right now. And so like, I'll just say like, you never get these opportunities to like witness transformation, much less to do so knowingly or even to participate participate in it so like take advantage of the moment for yourself and for others so thank you that. very much i think that's such a special way to end josh this has been an amazing conversation we will link to your twitter uh in the show notes it's at joshua rosenthal uh and as that's always cool. be well my friend thanks so much really appreciate it